I want you to come with me for a trip to the future. So the year's 2030, and in 2030, family farming remains at the forefront of Australian agriculture. Family farmers have future-proofed their businesses by working, collaborating with other producers for greater economy of scale, greater efficiency, and driving greater value in the supply chain. Beef producers such as me are bulk purchasing our farm, in farm inputs. We're co-purchasing machinery. We're aggregating cattle to access different supply chains. We're standardising our best management practices and we're leveraging that connectedness to deliver high quality, consumer focused meal solutions. Collective bargaining, cooperatives, alliances, partnerships, direct marketing are all models being used by producers to enable us to be in the supply chain rather than simply selling to it. Sharing the risk, but also the reward. Precision technology and the co connectivity of big data through the supply chain is enabling us to drive timely on-farm decisions, driving rapid production innovation and quick responses to changing consumer demands and community expectations. Farm succession planning is focused on retaining scale rather than dividing assets. Some farmers are aligning their production systems amalgamating with other farms for greater scale and efficiency. Equity partnerships to enable expansion and capital development are commonplace. This collaborative approach hasn't been a silver bullet, but it has enabled us to remove some of the vast swings in price cycle. It's enabled beef producers to be profitable, not just because we're low cost producers, but because, of we're, because we're part of a more optimised supply chain where we can deliver and drive new value. That's my preferred view of the future. And I guess for some it's a leap. But it's also a, a leap to think that 10 years ago, the idea that we'd all carry smartphones and have Facebook accounts was also a leap. So I think for producers with skin in the game, whether we think we can or whether we think we can't achieve this, we're probably going to be right. My journey to this point is really a culmination of my recent experiences in what's been a pretty challenging operating environment. If the northern beef producer had any doubt that they were at the end of the food chain, the perfect storm of price and weather over the last four to five years really confirmed it. The challenges of a very long dry and the roller coaster ride in pricing for me, has been overlaid with this ongoing commentary, questioning the capacity of the family farm to be relevant, sustainable and profitable. And while my initial response to headlines such as these is to bristle and maybe look for someone to blame, my more considered response is that maybe there's a point. How does the family farm remain relevant in what is an increasingly globalised and consolidated marketplace? And I guess being in the trenches as a farmer dealing with those realities challenged me and my family to really think about the why behind what we do. And for me and, I, and for a lot of farmers, that why is really this premise that family farming matters. That family farming has and always has been central uh, to the integrity of our food system. It's more than agriculture. It's about good food, it's about the environment, it's about our knowledge of the environment. We're talking about community, we're talking about a multi-generational view. And increasingly, we're not the only ones that think that way. Consumers and communities are increasingly running with the idea that the more they support family farmers, the more they know about and have confidence in the food that they're eating. And if we take a step back and look at history, or macro history, that finely chewed interplay between food and f family farming and environment has underpinned societies and civilizations. So I'm not suggesting it's corporates versus family farming because the line is definitely blurring. But as a family farmer, if we are going to be viable, we need to tackle some of the harsh realities around scale and profitability. So everyone's talking about the great food opportunity that's being delivered by the convergence of growth, uh, population growth and wealth. 
And beef is a big part of that. The projections are that global demand for beef will outstrip supply. And that sounds like a pretty good deal. But I think as a producer, we won't be in a position to take advantage of this opportunity without some significant change. And by change, I don't think that we've just got to be better grass managers or use better genetics or have better herd fertility or be more efficient. I think that's what we're going to have to do just to break even. If we want to be profitable, if we want to consistently be profitable and drive farm performance, I think, particularly as a northern beef producer, we need to think about our stake in the supply chain. We have to be in the supply chain rather than simply selling to it. And I guess for me, when I look at you know, why that is, I think there's, some really, there's two really big macro drivers that I see that are impacting on the way that we operate. And the first one is this idea that we, we do operate in a, in a, in a globalised, consolidated, vertically integrated marketplace. An industry that's increasingly dominated by a handful of big players. Now that's the reality, and, it, it's, and it's the reality whether you're in beef, or horticulture, or dairy, or, or whatever industry you're in. There's, there's um, more and more big players. And I guess it was alluded to this morning that it does become a little like playing a, a game of Monopoly. Once someone owns all the houses and hotels, it's really hard for others to play in the game, unless there's some kind of game-changing approach. I think the other significant driver is that this globalised, consumerised marketplace means that increasingly the power in the supply chain isn't in the producing, it's in the selling, because that's where you're closest to the consumer, you're closest to that ability to drive, anticipate, leverage the biggest margins. And I think this graph reflects that, that prices, farm gate prices, apart from this current supply-driven spike, have remained largely unchanged, while retail prices have risen steadily. So the current strategy for most of us in this kind of environment is to focus on productivity, making sure our cost of production is below the average price being paid for beef. And that's certainly key. But I think the cycles of commodity swings means it's no longer enough. That my individual farm productivity performance will not be enough to guarantee my farm profitability. And if you look at other industries, the focus has shifted to a more optimised supply chain approach. And I think the two go hand in hand. Productivity and an optimised supply chain are what make, makes it work. So being more focused on how we interact with the supply chain, having that end consumer in our line of sight, means we're making better production decisions. So we make sure we've got the right grass, the right genetics, the right herd management, because we've made a commitment to deliver, to deliver X amount of Y cattle by a certain date. So our focus shifts from selling what we produce to producing what we can sell. And, the, and our production decisions are driven by the needs of the broader supply chain. And for some, this is not a huge leap. Many are already doing this. But I'm suggesting there's value in applying this approach more broadly, particularly in the northern beef industry, and trying to overcome some of those traditional blockages, like management approach like land type variability, seasonable variability, that have historically challenged us in taking a more optimised approach. And importantly, I think there are some real enabling factors um, that mean producers can play a greater role in the supply chain. And the first one is this idea that we're no longer talking about the noun beef. It's the adjectives um, where the, the margin is increasingly at. And this is a phrase, beef with adjectives, that I've borrowed off the food consultant, Dr David Hughes. And it's a really valuable point that increasingly um, we have this huge sphere of value to satisfy by better meeting um, the different ideas, the different ideas about what con consumers value. So we're seeing this in the marketplace. Consumers wanting organic meat, grass-fed beef, ethical beef, dry-aged beef, Wagyu beef. So increasingly we're seeing that opportunity in different times of deep different times of types of adjectives. The other great enabling factor is technology, and it's been touched on already today. They're talking about in three years' time there being more than 50 billion connected devices in the world, all connecting and talking to each other. And farms and the technologies being used on farms are a big part of that. 
precision devices, drones, walkover weighing, grass monitoring technology, which means we can make better on-farm decisions. That the real power, the real leverage comes in the connectivity between my farm's devices and my ability to connect with other farms and make better decisions that can optimise the supply chain. So that data has value for the whole supply chain. The producers can leverage to enable a more optimised approach. The third enabling factor is this value in better leveraging this currency of family farming. And I think this is really our point of difference, that there's a value, a capacity, a trust that comes with family farming. And increasingly, many players are seeking to differentiate themselves in the marketplace by driving their connection, real or otherwise, to the family farmer. So it was a re revelation for me um, a couple of years ago to walk in a, into a Chipotle um, store in the States, uh, the, the large Mexican <coughs> fast food store, and see that you could buy a T-shirt saying family farmed. Here is a company clearly leveraging their connection, real or otherwise, to the family <coughs> farmer. So when quality food is increasingly about the story, about the why, this is a great competitive advantage. And farmers are best placed to leverage this story and leverage the margin that comes with it. So it's not just in the selling of food, but it's also in the kind, different kinds of partnership approaches that we can become involved in. So I think the opportunity for producers to leverage these factors and get into the supply chain is really through collaboration. That collaboration and the idea of producers collaborating in a more formalised way is really the game changer. It's, it's, it's the strategy that enables us to expand and vertically integrate. And it's not the only strategy. Uh, you can stay small and vertically integrate, and there's some fantastic examples of producers doing that. You can expand and vertically integrate, and also lots of examples of people doing that. But we can't all be in that space. The, the economics of processing in Australia, our export focus means it's high risk. So there's real value in farmers focusing on what they do well, managing farms, but I think collaboration is a great strategy for leveraging that value and looking at where you can leverage those value points for down the supply chain. And I think this is particularly important for Australian farmers who often lack scale. And scale is an issue for our industry. In Northern Australia, we have just 356 enterprises running over 5,500 head of cattle. So collaboration is about finding the leverage points where there's more value in working collaboratively than acting independently of each other. So what might some of those benefits look like? Well, the first two benefits are obviously around numbers, creating volume and continuity in how we sell cattle. And this window of short supply that we have at the moment is encouraging new types of relationships between producers and processors and aggregators who are increasingly in the marketplace. The Chinese market is also opening up more partners, more people looking to direct, directly invest and partner more closely with producer supply groups. So we have a window of opportunity at the moment where supply groups that have scale have, have leverage. It's also about consistency and quality of our product. So our production practices are variable, which means the end product is also going to be variable. And most producers are on a constant journey of improvement. We're constantly looking at how to improve the quality of those carcasses. But a more coordinated approach, supported by better data, can really accelerate that. And if you look at current production benchmark, benchmarks in the north, they indicate that this is a huge area of opportunity. There are also other benefits like shorter supply chains, which create a whole range of efficiencies and added value from animal, animal, animal welfare to carcass quality, removal of selling costs, to labour, to processing, to transport efficiency. There's also the capacity for a more transparent, traceable, verified supply chain. So it's not simply about compliance, but it's an opportunity to add and drive new value. It's a moving target, one that's increasingly got to keep ahead of changing consumer and community expectations. And I guess what's key here is if producers want the margin that comes with those systems, they've got to be prepared to drive it. And that was brought home to me a couple of years ago when I was in Canada, listening to the head of um, McDonald's Sustainability launch uh, the Sustainable Beef Program in Canada and telling producers, they'll, well, it doesn't mean I'm going to pay more for your beef, 
but it means you can be in a position to sell it. So if we want the margin that comes with those systems, we've got to be prepared to drive it. It also enables us to have greater traceability in, our, in evaluated products. So in 2013 in the UK when Horsegate broke, the, the patties that were found to be contaminated had ingredients tracked back to 40 different ingredient suppliers. And at that stage there was one abattoir in the UK that had a single source short supply chain and they'd sold to McDonald's and to Waitrose, the high-end uh, British retailer. So overnight, retailers and processors had to scramble to shore up and illustrate their 100% um, British-supplied beef. It highlighted the importance of traceable, short, verified supply chains. There's also the benefit of supply agility, and I think this is an increasing opportunity where while the food industry is dominated by large, globalised corporate players, they're increasingly struggling to be agile enough to meet the, con the ever-changing um, consumer tastes and expectations. So of the 12 biggest food and drink companies in, in the world, most are struggling for sales growth. So supply groups can enable greater supply agility. And the last benefit is about meaning and provenance. We know consumers have a complex hierarchy of needs. Increasingly, they just don't want to buy the product, but the why behind the product. And that relates to all cuts from the animal, not just the high value ones. So there's more scope to differentiate our story and our provenance when we're dealing with a, a, a more coordinated uh, producer supply group. So for producers, this approach does require some shift in thinking. And some of these shifts include um, shifting from thinking about cattle to thinking about, about beef to beef with the adjectives. And I think much of the industry is already moving down this track. A shift from thinking about simply kilograms or tonnages to looking at value. So we could be running less cattle but higher value animals. A shift in thinking about the countries that we export to or the markets to looking at the specific consumer segments that we seek to satisfy. A shift from thinking about purely production efficiency to whole chain efficiency. How what I do can affect someone else down the supply chain. So thinking about us as a sum of the parts. And lastly, from competition to collaboration. And this is probably the biggest challenge, but it's the most important one because changes will only occur at the speed of trust. Collaboration also means as an industry, we're better placed to get on the same page on some of those longer term issues facing the industry. Issues like getting beef on the right side of the health debate, shoring up beef screen credentials, tackling some increased competition, whether it's from other meat proteins or, th or synthetic sources, dealing with the ever-changing com community expectations. These are all issues that can shift our market, uh, but they're issues that can be better met and better dealt with with a collaborative approach. So how do we formalise producer collaboration? What's the vehicle? I think the vehicle is increasingly consumer business, uh, cooperative business models. Again, it's not the only model, but it's having an increasing resurgence as small businesses such as mine grapple with that increased um, constraint of market power. So cooperatives really work where there's benefits of farmers um, to who, who can work together to increase economy of scale drive shared value and reach further down the supply chain and benefit from an overall more coordinated approach. Some people say cooperatives are only, um, only work in agriculture when you're dealing with a, a perishable product. But I think the point is, is that beef is that increasingly that highly perishable product. It's a high end, high value product. When the specs have been met, that product needs to be sold. So it's no longer an option to stick that animal back into the paddock. So I think that the parameters of, of its relevance to beef have shifted. Some countries such as the US and the UK have a much stronger ethos of producer cooperation than we find in Australia. <coughs> so in the US there's about 30,000 ag cooperatives. Most farmers in the US are members of two or three cooperatives. They're buying their fuel cooperatively, they're buying their interest rates cooperatively, selling product cooperatively. In the UK there's about 600 ag cooperatives and the sector's grown a third since 2010. In Australia, there are 205 uh, ag cooperatives. In, the, in Australia, there are 205 ag cooperatives. And there's a lot of research around why Australian farmers don't like cooperating. 
And the research suggests that it has to do with Australian producers, Australian farmers being more independent, more introverted, more isolated. And that that has a lot to do with where we live. The fact that we live in quite isolated environments means we're used to doing things ourselves, we're used to being self-sufficient. There's also research that suggests that the, the history of, of statutory marketing bodies, um, our export focus means we're less likely to take risk uh, off farm. I think they're all valid reasons. And certainly when I talk to producers about the idea of cooperating, a lot of them say to me, well, why would I want to cooperate with my neighbour? I make money out of him. And if you look at the performance between the top 20% benef and the bottom 20%, there is a huge margin in there that someone else can take advantage of. But if you take a whole of industry approach, that's not moving the whole industry forward. I also think that the next generation of farmers, the Z Gens, we'll get collaboration in ways that we can only imagine. The use of social media platforms, the use of technology generally, means they're gonna be much more open to working together for, for, for shared benefit. So cooperatives must have a compelling need. And in most cases, that compelling need is a lack of profitability. So they commence because, because producers are frustrated with the price that they're getting. But that frustration, the need for a better price, is, is, is not enough. They've also got to endure because they grow and can, can create new value. So I've looked at lots of different cooperative models. And it is a model that works for all shapes and sizes. It's also a model that works well in small communities, where there's a real need for communities to band together to solve shared problems. One of the most interesting cooperatives I visited in the US was with a group called the Beef Marketing Group. I visited a small nondescript office in the middle of nowhere in, in central Kansas, a handful of staff, a few computers. These guys finished 550,000 head of cattle a year and they sold direct to the largest processor in the world, Tyson's. So scale for them is obviously a leverage point, but they don't seek to brand their own product. They don't seek to, to do it all themselves. They seek to work with the processor to look for how they can leverage value and opportunity. So one of those examples is now they sometimes go outside the processor and deal directly with the consumer and look for market opportunities that they can bring back to the processor and work on them together. And I think this approach is particularly key in beef, where the capital intensive nature of processing means it's not about trying to do everything. We don't need more wagons with wings. We need a partnership approach where there's opportunity to leverage shared value. So in that kind of relationship, the numbers, the volume that they have becomes a foot in the door. It enables them to, them to start the conversation. But that relationship endures but they can, because they can add new value to the relationship through consistency, through efficiency, through quality, through new value. So they talked about, at one stage, an issue being picked up on carcasses with E. coli. Very quickly, they could deal with that issue and put in place a system to prevent it into the future because they had a coordinated uh, supply group. So I think Australian farmers have lots of leverage points that lend themselves to greater collaboration. And with that leverage comes new value and cooperative business models can be the vehicle for that to happen. So with that opportunity in mind, last year I formed the Beef Co-op Project. I guess with the idea of and the vision of connecting with other beef producers to look at how to drive greater value through collaboration, a model that we're building from the ground up. So we've got a, a growing group of producers. We have got some possible funding in the, in the pipeline and we're starting to model the leverage points where it makes sense to work collaboratively. Areas like in, in the marketing of cattle, in the way we source our farm inputs, in the benchmarking of, of our production practices in the QA systems that we're using. And I think the timing's really right for this opportunity. It has broad application. I'm certainly not the only one doing it, but I think there's great advantage in these types of projects being a model that others can replicate. So what will happen? I mean, there's always the option of producers doing nothing. What will happen if producers aren't driving these opportunities? Well, the answer is that others will in the supply chain will, and we're seeing lots of examples of that, more processed, supplier-driven, supermarket-driven um, supply chains. Under most of these arrangements, producers are still simply selling an animal and taking a spot price on the day, 
maybe a premium off a spot price, but still a spot price, without any longer term opportunity for leverage or shared value. So I'd like to leave you with this thought. This pie chart represents the volume of Australia's beef production compared to the rest of the world. We produce about 4% of world supply. So our future we know has to be about quality, it has to be about value. To sell quality and value, we have to produce quality and value. And this value is better leveraged through collaboration on a whole range of levels. So supply chains will transform with or without family farmers. I'd love to see more of this, more of us driving this opportunity. And I think if we take the approach, if we just want to be incrementally improving, we're going to think of each other as competitors. If we want that exponential improvement, we've got to think of each other as collaborators. So I'd like to think the Beef Co-op Project can be part of that opportunity. Thank you.